Hi, I'm Carl Harald Jansson. I am the lead investment manager of the International Biotechnology Trust. Very much welcome to our presentation. I will uh, start with the disclaimer and uh, pointing you to the risks uh, of investing in this sector. And please read this uh, thoroughly before investing. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the sector, the biotech sector. And in the first half, and in the second half, I'm going to talk about the trust. And I'll try to make it in 25 minutes, so there's plenty of time for, for questions. But to start with, uh, we're going to run a short video of two minutes to introduce the trust. The International Biotechnology Trust invests in new therapeutic drugs for the serious disease of our age. The trust operates in a sector that has outperformed the broader equity markets over the last 20 years. I'm a medical doctor and I'm a certified financial analyst. And since the last 17 years, I've been on the investor side. The bulk of our investments are in listed stocks. And then we top it up with a little bit of investments in the unquoted area also. In this way, we get exposure in the trust to the breadth of the investment opportunity in the biotech sector. The trust gives our shareholders access to the global biotechnology market. Secondly, the trust gives our shareholders access to capital growth and also a 4% dividend which is paid biannually. One of the most exciting parts about biotechnology is the continuous level of innovation. International Biotechnology Trust has historically invested directly into unquoted companies. More recently, IBT has invested through a fund in order to generate a broader exposure to a wider number of investments. We spend time with academics seeking out that innovative new insight that could translate into a new drug. And if we can then develop that into a drug that shows safety and efficacy in patients, we can generate substantial investment returns. We look for companies with uh, good management, companies that are well financed, and of course, with an important new uh, product that has a great market. We also look for mergers and acquisitions. It's a constant theme in our sector, and we look for companies that can also be acquired. One of our most successful investments has been Kite Therapeutics. Now, Kite Therapeutics made us a great return for the trust. Their technology removes the immune cells from the cancer patient where chemotherapy no longer works, re-engineers those cells, and puts them back into the patient in order to tackle the disease. The long-term drivers for the biotechnology sector is that we're seeing a massive increase in the aging population. In fact, that population is going to double in the next generation. And this is being met by a rapid increase in innovation within in the biotechnology sector and a huge increase in drugs and clinical development. The role of the board essentially is one of governance and oversight. Governance dealing with all the issues of being a listed company and oversight in particular in terms of the role of the investment manager and overseeing what they do. SV Health Investors has a team of over 50 professionals in life sciences in the US and the UK and we, International Biotechnology Trust, have access to that team for the management of our portfolio. So this video you will find on our website. Uh, the trust is managed by, uh, by me. Uh, I have a background in as medical doctor and also in science. And uh, I also have a, I'm a certified financial analyst and I've been doing this type of investments in various firms for almost 20 years now. Elsa Craig, Marek Przyszynski also helped me with the uh, public investments. And Kate Bingham is the manager for the unquoted part of the portfolio. She's also the managing partner of SV Health Investors. The trust is uh, listed on the London Stock Exchange in 1994. And uh, since 2001, uh, it is SV Health Investors that manages, uh, has the management contract to, to run the management of the trust. SV is a uh, house that was uh, founded in 93. Uh, it has raised uh, $2.9 billion across eight uh, venture funds and uh, manages the International Biotechnology uh, Trust. It is focused 100% on healthcare, so that's the only thing we do. We have an office in Boston and an office in London, so we cover both the US and the European markets. And we are th uh, 72 people uh, that we can draw, um, draw from regarding knowledge about the sector. But the biotech sector has uh, grown 13% year over year for the last 20 years. If one looks at the Nasdaq Biotech Index, 
that is a biotech index in the, in the US. So the US covers most, is, is the most important market for biotech. Europe is the, the second biggest, and then in Asia, it's very little to invest in. So the biotech sector has uh, returned 13% over 20 years. The MSCI World Healthcare Index, kind of all healthcare stocks in the public markets in the world, has returned 7.8%, and the MSCI World Equity Index approximately 6.6%. You know, so it's definitely a sector that has uh, outperformed uh, other sectors. It can also pay a dividend. Usually a sec this sector doesn't pay any dividend, it's a growth sector. But uh, in the trust, if you invest in this trust, then um, there is a dividend of 4% of net asset value that we started to pay in 2016. And uh, it's paid out of uh, capital reserves uh, and uh, it's uh, underpinned by, by, the under by the growth of, uh, of this sector. So, um, can the growth continue then into the future? This 13%, can it outperform? Well, I don't know, but let's look at some of the drivers behind the growth. One of the drivers is the increase in the population in the world. We expect, you know, to 2050 to have a 33% increase of the number of people. But more importantly, we're going to double the number of elderly in the world. So on this graph, you can see that for the world, it's going to go from 12% to 22% that are above uh, 65. Now, why is that important? Well, the reason is that, uh, that the share of spending is more among the elderly in healthcare. So if this is the population split from 18 to, to 65 years old, you can see that the spend above 65, and if you include above 55, it's really half of the spend. And it's not very strange, is it? We all get our diabetes and high blood pressure and so on when we are older rather than when we are young. So on the demand side, we can see uh, uh, that the demand will increase. And uh, on the output side, we can see that the industry is generating more drugs to, uh, to treat you know, serious diseases. This is uh, the number of drugs, and this is the, year, the last you know, 15 years. And we can see for each year, there is an increase in the projects in development in phase one, phase two, or phase three. Phase one is the first phase where you test if a drug is toxic or not. Phase two is dose finding, and phase three is kind of the, the phase where you finally prove that it works or not. So uh, <clears throat> this has led to uh, that there is an uh, increased number of drugs approved. This is from the Food and Drug Administration, the US regulatory authorities that uh, approves drugs. And you can see over the, since 98, over the last 20 years, as of you know, early November, we are at the highest number of the approved new drugs. And the reason is that we have more, you know, more knowledge about what the human being is and uh, what the diseases are. And, and hopefully we can cure more diseases, even if there are some that we still don't know very much about, like Alzheimer's, I guess, we're still in the dark. Cancer, we are halfway maybe to start to understand how everything is going. So this will transform into um, top line growth that will exceed a trillion dollars in the world of uh, prescription drugs. You can see there's been a little bit of stagnation here and then there's a reacceleration of sales uh, because of the factors we talked about. And this is uh, from uh, Evaluate Pharma drug um, industry report. So maybe take it with the same salt of grain. Maybe it's not going to be 6.5, but still I think it's going to be a, a healthy, healthy number. And one sector is growing more that we call orphan diseases, or rare diseases. There are about uh, uh, many thousands of these rare diseases that we are now uh, starting to be able to treat. So these are all the good and nice things. And then we have a few uh, uh, things uh, on the risk side to think about. Politics in the US is very important. And uh, regulation is also important. It seems to be relatively stable in Europe and in Asia and Japan. Uh, uh, the country where it's mostly most turbulent and where one should look most to is the US because that's the biggest market for drugs regarding sales and profits and uh, any change there would affect uh, the drug companies and biotech companies. So the midterm selection that we had recently in November turned into what is called the gridlock, I think they say. Uh, it's uh, when uh, Democrats and Republicans kind of share the power in a way, uh, and the system cannot really produce new uh, 
uh, in, a, in an effective way, you know, new, new policies. The Republicans are in command of the Senate, it's upper house, and the Democrats, uh, the House of Representatives, that is the lower house. But definitely, rhetorics are going to be high, and um, um, but we don't think that they can pull through too much of new legislation. And the next elections in 2020 will be important, of course. Uh, it is a very important issue, but the result that we think is that in the near term there will be limited changes regarding new laws. On the regulatory side, uh, it's pretty clear that the new FDA commissioner is, is uh, positive to innovation. He says that more competing drugs on the market is good for prices, so more innovation, more drugs of the same type that are innovative will compete on price, and then we're going to see to that the generics are um, also um, kind of a, a, a good place that we want to promote. <clears throat> so the result here is also that you know we see limited changes in the near term, but uh, on the longer term, I think one has to be uh, clear about the fact what you also mentioned. You know we can't just keep on increasing prices of uh, of old drugs. We have to come with new drugs that have a you know, we can set a good price for for a period of time. And let's not forget that there is some type of contract here between society and industry. You you set the high price for the time you have your patent protection or your regulatory protection, and after that time your drug will become generic and the prices will be very low. Even an expensive cancer drug will have a low price uh, uh, 10 years from now. So I think we can all agree to that this is a, it's a, it's a good uh, machine, so to say, for the longer term. Even if short term there will be, of course, high prices for new, new drugs. Uh, Valuation-wise, the sector uh, is uh, at uh, quite low level, I would say, on PE multiples. Uh, historically low. Uh, we have a split between larger companies like uh, Amgen, Biogen and Gilead uh, that are, uh, have a relatively low PE multiple. As you can see, almost single digit. This was the end of August, so now they've come down another 20%. The cut here is end of August on the slides because that's our financial year is the end of of August. So we don't think the sector is expensive uh, uh, in a way. So let's uh, then uh, shift over to the to the trust and uh, talk of, about the performance to start with. This is the five-year performance uh, since uh, I started uh, to be a lead investment manager in September of 13. So I've been here for more than five years now. And over this time period the trust has performed 175% uh, versus you know the index of 131 and all share index of 44 and this is share price so to be honest uh, there was a larger discount here than uh, on the share price than in the start than at the end but if we shift to uh, looking at the net asset value we have over five years outperformed the index uh, last year we have uh, to the end of August slightly under the index the main reason is that we have shifted a little bit out of the larger a uh, lot of companies into the more growth area where we see uh, uh, the new drugs being launched and that on a macro backdrop maybe wasn't the best decision a half a year ago or a year ago um, since um, smaller companies have become or a little bit more volatile when when you have a, a negative macro situation so we in, uh, in October here we have seen uh, uh, as you know the market is down pretty much and what I would like to you to point to is that uh, if the world equity index was down five percent the biotech index is down more remember these are smaller um, mid mid-size companies with a higher beta so the sector the biotech sector has a higher beta than uh, to the market in general so when there's a downturn it will go down harder and then when it's going to go up it's going to go up stronger uh, uh, mainly it's the interest rates uh, increasing the negative uh, QE I think that is, is driving this and the bigger scare that the interest rates will go up higher and the smaller companies will of course be uh, hit more since it's a DCF valuation of future earnings and not earnings today. We also have uh, uh, Brexit, Italy, China and so on that, uh, that affects everyone. We all know about this and uh, also this sector is, is hit pretty hard. On the Brexit term, uh, the, the trust uh, is invested in uh, mostly in the US dollar. So we have 80% US dollars and about 20% European currencies and not the British pounds and no hedging. So it will float with, with the pound versus the, um, uh, the international currencies. 
But uh, fundamentally, you know, the sector is in, uh, uh, in good shape regarding innovation and uh, new drugs. From the regulatory point of view in the US and politically, there is, a, there is a backdrop of kind of trying to put the lid on, on, on drug prices. But uh, I don't think they will change the US system into a one-payer system that we have in Europe. It will stay a multi-payer system and within those buckets. It, for us as, as investors, we think more about the competition between various drugs and how that can affect the market. So uh, we have positioned our, our trust <coughs> investments in a way to, uh, to uh, mitigate some of the risks and take advantage of uh, the main driver driving forces. So to start with market cap wise, we, we cover everything. You know, we have large caps, 35%, uh, mid caps, 40%. Small caps 12, and then we have a SV Fund 6, that's a venture fund that has now 22 investments. So we, as was said on the video, we have invested in, in unquoted companies historically. To a large extent, we changed that four years ago to stop doing that, and instead, uh, two years ago, to invest in a venture fund that, uh, that is a, a one-term commitment to invest $30 million, draw down about 22 million pounds at that time, and um, it will give you kind of a broad uh, exposure to the venture side. And um, we expect this to be uh, um, around, you know, when it's finally fully invested, approximately 10%, where we, that's where we would like you know, the unquoted side to be. And then we have a legacy unquoted investments. That's a runoff portfolio of the, 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 the unquoted investments we did, you know, more than four years ago. On the also diversify on the profitability. We have half the companies are profitable. Uh, we have a 25% delivering revenue, and we have development stage companies. I already talked about the geography spread. It's not that we like the US, but that's where the most of the industries and where most of the companies that to invest in are located. And in Asia, we don't see very much. And then on the therapeutic area here, we try to put our portfolio in such a shape that we uh, uh, we invest where there's pricing power for the drugs, basically. So <clears throat> that is uh, oncology, uh, rare diseases, and, and then some other areas. So we, when, you, when you invest, you have to think about what are the competitors on the market, what other drugs are there on the market, could it be pricing power or not, what are the laws and legislation regarding, regarding uh, the drugs. For example, uh, uh, the insurance companies in the U.S., they can uh, play a Dutch auction game with the uh, with similar drugs to, in order to, uh, to reduce the price from the providers. However, in certain areas, they can't do it. You know, so in oncology, you have to provide all the drugs, while in other areas, they don't have to do that. So it's, uh, that's the way we think about uh, constructing our portfolio in such a way that we take advantage of the innovation that we can see. There's a lot of innovation in oncology and also mitigate the, the pricing pressure that happens in certain areas. Yeah, this is more to discuss uh, about the risk of the pricing pressure, uh, basically is what I, uh, what I mentioned in the, in the previous slide. And um, so we focus mostly on high medical need where there is, you know, um, life expectancy is involved or, or children and, and serious diseases uh, with a lot of handicap rather than to think about investing in the next uh, pill for headache or something that we already have, if I may express myself that way, that we already have plenty of therapies for. And I uh, also mentioned earlier in the presentation that uh, a year ago we, we had a bit more large caps. We have uh, reduced that a little bit. And uh, hindsight, maybe that wasn't the smartest thing to do on the market backdrop. Uh, we made us underperform a little bit on the one year uh, horizon. But I really think that uh, it's here where we're going to see the, the future growth, the future um, drugs. And, uh, and these companies that having the blue here have more of growth problems right now with the, with the maturing um, products and, and price pressure. And also patent expiries actually. A quick uh, one on the uh, M&A. We have a uh, M&A is a hallmark of the industry where um, you have a uh, innovation taking place in smaller companies. Uh, smaller companies do not have a global distribution machine. So if you move an asset from a small company into a big one with global distribution, you will uh, see an increase on net asset value over the lifespan of the patent protection. And in our trust, we have over the last two years harvested these 
M&A transactions. Uh, and you can see the last one happened here before summer. The system is being pretty empty here. And well, I think it's, uh, well, we, we talk about the dry spell and these things, but I think it's more stochastic. You know, these things have, sometimes happen, you know, three at once and then nothing. And now when prices have come down, as you have seen, the valuations have come down and also expectations on takeout prices. I think that we will start to see again here uh, new M&A transactions. They never happen overnight. It's always a discussion between the uh, seller and the buyer and the investment bank and, and, uh, and bidding and so on. So uh, it might not be until the beginning of next year. But I definitely think that this reduction in the valuations uh, will uh, initiate uh, in a new, new M&As. Um, unquoted portfolio, I also mentioned this briefly. We have uh, uh, at the end of August 12% in the trust. It differentiates the trust, uh, diversifies the trust and re reduces the volatility. And it also gives you access to this part of the sector that uh, is difficult to, uh, to get an access to. Uh, we talked about the fund uh, six now being the bigger part and the individual, individual investments that's a runoff portfolio now being a smaller part. Two years from now, I expect this blue to be bigger and the red one to be even smaller. So investment process, we follow a very traditional model of kind of looking at uh, various companies to invest in in our sector, IPOs versus mergers. And uh, from them, we pick what we would like to, to invest in and look deeper. We use uh, risk mitigation, trying to avoid things that are very risky areas also avoid binary events. Uh, we follow the what's going on with our news flow spreadsheet. Uh, we can do gearing up to 30%. It's in prospectus. We currently have about 15% facility from the board and we are currently not geared. So you get the sense of where we think yeah, uh, to be a little bit more defensive right now. We, do, we use the gearing tactically so that when the market is really down, the VIX is up, then we gear up the VIX comes back down again, we pay back the debt. So we kind of pay, play it a little bit more tactically than to be strap on a continuous, very high gearing at, at this uh, late stage of the cycle. And on the m and where well, we see m and possibilities, we do DCF valuations to see that we get this, it right. Risk mitigation, uh, uh, try to not to lose money. We know what we're doing, it's our area of expertise. We follow the news flow, we have active management around binary events. So companies that have a phase three trial, that they're gonna know in December that uh, if it's gonna work or not, make it or break it, valuation might you know, stay up or you might lose your money. We try to avoid those type of gambling situations by, by not owning the shares at that time, even if we like it longer term. We might buy it back after if we think it's a, it's a good, uh, good results that are undervalued or um, it was an overreaction to the downside. Uh, we talked about this one, pricing power. We like a diversified portfolio, traditional in that way. And then uh, you also have a more diversification with the unquoted side. And this is the summary slide uh, to, uh, to say that uh, you get exposure to growth and yield through this trust. Sector has strong fundamental. We have a unique approach to risk mitigation. Uh, we're part of a team that know what we're doing and uh, you get also a spice here with unquoted investments in the trust. Thank you for Thank you. listening.